So first, uh, let me define functional encryption, or FE. Uh, suppose Alice wants to send some data M to the cloud Bob uh, to delegate storage and computation on this data, but she still wants some privacy on her data. So she's going to encrypt it in such a way that Bob only learns some particular function F on M, and nothing more. So you can think of F of a, as a, a function that computes descriptive statistics on the encrypted data, or some SQL query or some such thing. So because Bob only learns this particular F of M, we have some notion of privacy. In particular, Bob doesn't learn the entire message M. So this is what we want to achieve, and FE allows to achieve that uh, using a trusted setup that is going to generate a public key, thanks to which Alice can encrypt the message M, and a master secret key that is used by a key generation algorithm that can pr produce um, different key for different functions. So SKF is a particular key for the particular function F, thanks to which Bob can extract from the encryption of M, F of M, as I said, and nothing more. And you can think of uh, other user, Carl, that wants to compute D of M, so he will get a different key, SK of J, of G, sorry, uh, that allows him to compute D of M. And so to be a bit more precise, the security we want is uh, resistance to a collision uh, of secret keys. So if an adversary gets the public key, but also different secret keys for different functions, different functions, the adversary should not learn anything more than what each individual key uh, allows him to learn. All right. So here in this case, we only learn f of m and g of m and nothing more. Cannot combine keys to get extra information. Um, formally, this is captured by indistinguishability-based security, where the adversary uh, chooses some pair of message, m0, m, m1. And um, as long as the adversary only gets secret keys that do not distinguish between these two messages, the adversary will be enable, uh, computationally it will be unable for him to distinguish between the encryption of M0 from an encryption of M1. And it's also interesting to, so usually the adversary can do everything adaptively. So he first gets a public key and then uh, choose the message M0 and M1 depending on the public key and the secret key he gets uh, in general. But you can also consider restricted class of adversary that are called uh, selective because uh, this adversary all choose M0 and M1 before uh, seeing the public key, so independently of everything. Uh, so, so that will be useful later. So, so this is a weaker notion of adaptive security. All right, so now what do we know how to do for FE? So there are some general feasibility results for all circuits. Uh, they are based on strong assumptions, namely a distinguishability of obfuscation for circuits. And uh, on the other hand, there are some work to try to build uh, FE from standard assumption, much weaker, such as EDH, but uh, they do so for restricted classes of function. Uh, so this is uh, the case of ABDP, we, we built a functional encryption for DDH uh, for these particular classes of function in our product where the message is a vector and the function is also a vector of same, same dimension. And the function applied on M gives you the inner product and nothing more. And so in part, so you could do, uh, you can compute weighted sum on encrypted data with this. And the ciphertext size is linear, it's a number of group elements that is linear in uh, the dimension n. So following this more bottom-up approach, we try to build a, from standard assumption, FE for slightly richer class of function. So what we did was to build FE for uh, quadratic functions, essentially. So the message now is a, is a pair of vector m and x, uh, x and y two vectors, and the function is a bilinear map. So f of, of m will give you x times f times y. And the important thing uh, is that the ciphertext size is linear in n plus m. All right. So we do so using a standard assumption based on pairing. So this is important that the size is uh, linear in m plus m because, uh, as you can see, you can already do quadratic function from inner product by simply expressing um, a bilinear map has a huge vector, but that would blow up the size uh, to n times m. So this is really about in, in efficiency improvement here. Uh, yeah, I was saying that there are some independent works that also build quadratic, uh, FE for quadratic functions. Uh, there is the work uh, Anand Sahai and uh, Lin. So the, the main difference with uh, these works and our work is that they are private key and we are public key. Uh, but to be fair, they also achieve some uh, slightly stronger notion where the secret key hides the underlying function. 
and it's not achievable in public key. All right, so this is incomparable set of results. And also, uh, this paper do, do much more than just building a quadratic MP. And so, um, actually, we have two constructions. So let's look at the assumption. So the um, Ananta high is based on ad hoc assumption, just defined in a generic group model, whereas uh, lean is based on standard assumption, SXDH, so pairing. And uh, we build two constrictions. One is from standard assumption, and the other is based on generic group model. But uh, first of all, this is more efficient. This one is more asymptotically more efficient. And also, it satisfies a stronger notion of security. So at the beginning, I mentioned that you can also think of a restricted security, selective security. So this is a case of all of these constructions. They are only selectively secure. And uh, this one, the one based on the generic group model, is adaptively secure, which is the security you want in the end. Okay, so for, for this talk, I'm uh, mostly going to talk about this uh, construction, the reason being that uh, proof in the general group model tend to be less intuitive, so I'm, I'm more going to focus on this one. All right. uh, and also, one contribution of our paper is uh, some application to predicate encryption. What is predicate encryption? It's a particular case of functional encryption where uh, the message is a, uh, contains two things, uh, a plain text, uh, and uh, an attribute, which is uh, as before, x, uh, a pair of vector x and y. And now the function on, uh, of m will be output the plain text if the bilinear map evaluation evaluates to uh, the, yeah, the bilinear map evaluates to zero, and nothing else. So nothing is revealed about the plain text if this is not zero. All right. So this is a predicate encryption, fully hiding predicate encryption, encryption to be precise. And what we do is build this thing for, uh, with uh, ciphertext size again, uh, linear in n plus m versus uh, previ prior works with, which would uh, with whom we, so you could obtain n times m with prior works. All right. But I'm not going to talk about uh, this predicate encryption. I'm only going to talk about functional encryption for this talk, for the rest of this talk. All right, so this is roughly the high level view of our construction. We want to build Fe for this function here that takes a pair of vector and outputs x times f times y. All right. Um, the idea is to encrypt uh, x, the pair of uh, vector x and y, by first encrypting x and independently encrypting y with linear size encryption. And uh, we want to combine these two encryption here in a way that depends on f to obtain uh, an encryption of f of x, y under some public key which also will depend on f. And this thing here uh, should be a, a decryptable only if you know the secret key of f, sk of f. And uh, nothing else, uh, otherwise nothing should be revealed about f, x, y. So the way we do this is uh, using a pairing, a bilinear maps, that takes group element from some source group, uh, which is generated by little g. So you can pair a, a group element g, little g to the a with another group element little g to the b to obtain uh, in the target group um, some e uh, paired with g and g and uh, the multiplication in the exponent. So you can do one multiplication. All right, so we'll, we'll use that to combine things from here with things from here to obtain an encryption in the target group. All right, that's roughly the idea. Uh, now I'll go more into details. I'll do so in three steps. First, I'll give you a private key FE. That's a little bit simpler. And that will, um, w that will be um, simplified, and it's only going to be secure in a generic group model. And uh, it's not, yeah. So this is for simplicity. And then I'll show you how to get from private key to public key, but also st still a, a scheme that is too simple to be proven secure under standard assumption, it's just to give you some intuition. And finally, I'll show you some briefly some of the techniques we use to get actually security from standard assumption. All right. So first, uh, let, let me go uh, de de describe the private key FE. Uh, so as I said, we'll use a pairing, and I'm going to introduce uh, some notation. So, uh, yeah, so these are all prime order groups in our case. And the notation I'm going to use is uh, I'm going to write bracket A for any exponent A over A in ZP to uh, denote G, little g to the A. Uh, you can generalize this notation for vectors and so on. And so, so what is the master secret key? It's just a bunch of random group elements, one for each uh, index i and j. That's it. And the encryption takes a pair of vector x and y and is going to compute a bunch of uh, row vector, which are xi concatenated with 
the randomness ri that comes from the master secret key times a random invertible two by two matrix W that's picked freshly uh, at random at each encryption. And there is also a bunch of column vector uh, which are, as you can read, W minus one, the inverse of W and uh, multiplied by the vector YJ SJ. So that's, that's all the, cy the ciphertext. Uh, an important property is that if you pair the i row vector here with the j column vector here, what we get is a target group using a pairing is this, xi, yj, plus ri, sj. And in general, if you know a bilinear map f in the, over zp, you can, by pairing appropriately the row vector with the column vector, what you get is f of xy, which is the useful information we want, plus some blinding factor f of rs. So if you set up the secret key for f to be exactly this term here, then you can recover f of xy only if you have the secret key for f, right, intuitively. So this is a scheme. So the security comes from the fact that uh, the only meaningful thing an adversary could compute is given many si challenge ciphertext, is um, the only thing it can compute meaningful that is a pairing a row vector from one ciphertext with a column vector from this same ciphertext. Because if it tries, for example, to do mix and match attacks uh, by pairing a row vector from one ciphertext with a column vector from on another ciphertext, that would be meaningless because uh, it will be paired with a different W. So it can, so yeah, it, it will be meaningless. And this can be uh, formalized in the general group models. So essentially, it's as if the adversary view only contains uh, this kind of value here for um, any f of the adversary's choice. So this is all the adversary can see, essentially. You can capture that formally using DGM. And uh, of course, so the adversary is allowed to get some uh, secret key for some functions. So if you get S SK of f, of course, is the adversary is going to be able to recover f of xy. That's uh, normal. But uh, if um, f is not uh, in the collusion of keys that the adversary gets, then, uh, as I said, f of x, y is going to be computationally blinded by this factor here. So in the end, the adversary only learns f of x, y for uh, the functions f that he could get a cue for. All right? So at intuitively, this is a proof. Right, so now uh, let's look at the, so this was the, the pri uh, private key scheme. If we want to make it a public key scheme, well, it, we, we need to make the ri and the sj as group elements public. So the public key is the previous master secret key. But now, of course, the, all the secret key for all functions f are publicly computable. So that mm, should not be. <coughs> so we modify this secret key for all f to be in the source group now. But still, you can still decrypt uh, ciphertext using only the public key. So we need to make use of the fact that now the secret keys are in the group is in, in, uh, are in the source group. So the way we do so is uh, by adding some randomness in the encryption. We'll pick a, uh, freshly at each, encrypt, encrypt, each encryption uh, a random scalar sigma that is going to be uh, inserted here and also added in the, as part of the ciphertext as a group element. All right. So remember, bracket notation means that so this is g to the little g to the sigma. All right, so now when we, pair the I, um, when we pair this thing with this thing, what we get is, as before, f of x, y, plus now f of r, s, but multiplied by this sigma, right? So now, essentially, intuitively, the public key becomes useless because the public key, the public key only gives you f of r, s, but in the target group. And what you need is to decrypt is sigma times f of r, s. So you really require the fact that the secret, secret key of f now is in the source group. So again, uh, intuitively, so the intuition can be translated into um, a proof, at least in the generic group model. For standard assumption, we'll have to do a little more work. But intuitively, it's as if the adversary view only contains some random sigma for, from the ciphertext, and this mm, kind of um, quantity here, and nothing more. Everything else the adversary can compute will be useless, intuitively, and from this, uh, the adversary can only get f of x, y if he knows or she knows the secret key for f. Right. And if she, she doesn't know, then this is blinded again. So that's it for security. So now we want to have a proof uh, that is secure in the standard model. 
Uh, one technique we use uh, is inspired by uh, what is called dual pairing vector space. That's introduced by Okamoto Takashima in the context of attribute-based encryption, adaptively secure attribute-based encryption in prime order pairing groups. Uh, you don't need to know exactly what this is. All you need to know is that essentially we are gonna change, transform the scheme, the previous scheme I showed you, by uh, transforming Ri and RJ into vectors now. Um, what are these vectors? So Ri is just a random vector and Sj is just a random vector also of appropriate dimension, um, dimension two in fact, it's sufficient and um, concatenated with some zero slot. You will see why this slot is useful later. And all of this is also used with a dual basis. V and V minus one, so V again is a random invertible matrix. Okay, uh, okay so. So the, imp the impact of on the secret key would be this. So before this was a secret key, now this is just like this. I just replaced Ri and Sj by this thing. This is what I obtained, okay? So, so far so good, but why do, we need, why do we do that? What is the magic of a dual pairing vector space? Uh, it allows to computationally switch this blue vector here by uh, this vector here. So essentially you can add um, anything you want in the extra slot. So you can, for all xi and yj of, of your choice, you can say that this is computationally indistinguishable from this by using a standard assumption, dealing in our case. Um, and also you have this quadratic term and somehow we could show that we can, uh, this effect on the secret key is to have exactly, to exactly had what we want, f of xy. Um, so origin, originally in the DPVS, uh, there is only one, uh, there is only these vectors. There are no quadratic terms. So the novelty, the technical novelty in this work is to also, so it's to carry on the DPVS proof uh, in the presence of quadratic terms. So this is a te technical challenge we solved, all right? So now let's go back to our scheme and see how this applies. Um, so now I just replaced RISJ with vectors. This is the scheme we have. This is very close to the scheme that's actually in the paper. Uh, and uh, so now everything is blown up, the size is a bit larger. Um, and so again, intuitively, there is one part of the proof that I'm not going to exactly explain, but intuitively, uh, the adversary can only extract from this ciphertext um, this kind of information. It can only, the only meaningful thing can compute again is that uh, pairing this ve row vector with this column vector. Anything else is useless. and. Uh, the challenge we also saw is to prove that in the standard, uh, under standard assumption. All right, so again, it's as if the adversary only gets this uh, information. This is the adversary view, essentially. And um, now using this magic of uh, DPVS, we can switch the secret key for F. Uh, for, uh, for all the secret keys that are not queried by the adversary, we can switch them and uh, as before I showed you, you can add an, F, an, an offset f of x. So es essentially with the dealing assumption using the DPVS, we can erase all the information about, about f of x, y. All right, so that's essentially the proof. Uh, to conclude, so we built a FE scheme for quadratic functions with ciphertext size linear in n plus m uh, from pairing. So these are, we have two schemes. One is adaptively secure, the other is selectively secure. Uh, but they are based on different assumptions, and this is exactly the ciphertext size uh, in number of group elements, of source group elements, all right? Um, so, as an open question, it would be interesting to explore uh, from standard assumption, for example, pairing, but maybe something else, what uh, the, the classes of function, more expressive classes of function that we could build. Okay, that concludes my talk, thank you.